Hello everyone, today we're going to look at a really interesting physics problem and what we've got is a rope or a string so that's what is represented by this horizontal line at the bottom of this diagram here and we also have a cylinder as you can see in this diagram right and the rope is wrapped around um, this cylinder some number of times so we're going to say n times and we're pulling one side of the rope with a force of p0 and the other side of the rope with a force of P. All right, so we've got this rope, we're saying it's wrapped around the cylinder n times, and there's friction between the rope and the surface of the cylinder, <clears throat> and the coefficient of friction um, that characterizes that friction is mu. All right, so these are the kind of parameters of the problem. And what we want to answer is, let's say we're holding this end of the rope on the left, with a force of uh, P0, right? Then we want to know how hard do you have to pull on the other end, so this this right side. Um, what is that force P that you have to apply in order to cause uh, the rope to slip and actually move relative to the cylinder? Okay. And what we are deriving is an equation that actually has a name. It's called the capstan equation. Now, um, you might not have heard uh, the word capstan before, I hadn't until recently. It's basically a cylinder um, like this, which they use on boats to wrap ropes around because that basically um, lets you multiply the force that you that you pull on a rope with, right? So what we're talking about here does actually have a, a practical application um, in these devices called capstans. Okay, so let's make a start on actually solving this. And whenever you have a really complicated problem like this, uh, a good approach is usually to break it down into small elements um, that you can deal with more easily, right? So essentially what we're going to be doing is uh, thinking of the rope as a bunch of small elements uh, collect connected together and thinking about each of those elements individually. So let's do that, right? So let me just uh, draw uh, some lines. I'm going to draw a line. Uh, from the center of the circle down here, all right, and <clears throat> just give me a moment, I'm going to explain why I am doing this, all right, so basically what I'm doing here is defining the element of rope that we're going to be looking at, so I'm going to say this, basically this bit here, this little um, element of arc, right, from here to here, that's the bit of rope that we are, we're going to be looking at, and it is located at an angle of theta uh, measured anti-clockwise from the vertical, right, as, as you can see in this diagram. And I'm going to say the angular extent of this element of rope is going to be d theta. Okay, so d because it's a really small element, okay. So it's, a, it's an infinitesimal quantity. Right, so here's our little uh, bit of rope, and what we're going to do is think about what forces are acting on this rope. Okay, so let's draw on a couple of arrows. Right, so the first thing I'm going to draw on um, <clears throat> is going to be uh, a tension. All right, and so because it's a rope and we're pulling on it, there's going to be a tension in the rope, right? And so um, I'm going to uh, draw an arrow and it's going to be acting tangentially, right? It's going to be acting tangentially because that's the kind of instantaneous direction of the rope. It's along the tangent of the cylinder. So there's going to be one arrow kind of pointing like that. And I'm going to label that as T for tension, right? And so that is the force that the left, you know, the part of the rope on the left here is pulling on this element of rope with a force of T. But of course, the other side of the rope is also pulling on that element with what could in general be <clears throat> a slightly different tension, right? So I'm going to draw another arrow uh, along the tangent on the other side of that element. So you can see they're not quite aligned, these two forces. This is also a tension, but we're not going to assume that these tensions are equal. And I'm going to write this tension as T plus DT, meaning it's kind of similar to the, the tension that is pulling towards the left, but it could be slightly different, and the small difference in tension we're writing is dt because it's an infinitesimal quantity. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> what other forces do we have acting? Well, we are going to have a reaction force, right? <clears throat> a normal reaction force because the rope is going to pushing against the cylinder, and that is just going to act in the normal direction, so straight outwards, like something like this, right? So I'm going to write that as r. Okay. So it's the normal reaction force 
from the cylinder onto the uh, rope. And there's one more force that we have to consider, which is the friction. <clears throat> right, so we have a coefficient, coefficient of friction in this problem, so friction is going to be crucial. Um, which direction does the friction act in? Well, it's going to be um, perpendicular to the normal reaction rate, it's going to act along the tangent. So I'm going to draw on a friction arrow, um, something, something like this, right? So I'm going to draw a friction on that, and we're going to call that F, and we've got a 90 degree angle here. Now, this force diagram might be looking really complicated, but the good thing is because d theta is really small, we're going to be able to use a small angle approximation, um, and it's going to be much easier than it might look at this stage. So I think that's all the forces we need to consider. I'm not going to think about the, um, the weight of the rope itself, for now at least. Um, so let's start considering how the forces balance in this situation. So. Clearly, it's not accelerating in the radial direction, right? Well, it's not accelerating in any direction, but let's first consider the the radial direction, right? So the outwards direction. And the force acting directly outwards on this element is R, right? It's just the normal reaction of the cylinder on the element. How about the inwards force, which is balancing that? Well, um, that is coming from the tensions, right? So because these tensions act at at either end of this um, rope element, they're in slightly different directions. And if you were to draw on a tangent line in the middle of this um, of this element, you would see that you know the, these tensions are not quite aligned. And this angle here, by geometry, um, this is going to be d theta divided by two, all right? Which is basically because if we kind of think about the center. We think about the center of our element, draw a line like this, right, to this this midpoint of the element there. Then this angle here, this one here, that's just d theta over 2. This one here is also d theta over 2. And so by geom geometry, this angle between t plus dt and the, and the tangent is d theta over 2. Um, and similarly, we have another angle over here. Um, which is the same, right? d theta over 2 is the same just by, by symmetry. OK, so let's think about what that actually means. So in terms of radial forces, both of these tensions have a, an inwards radial component, right? And so let's think about this, the t first. Uh, if we resolve that along the radial direction, we just get t sine of d theta over 2, right? And then we also get a contribution from the t plus dt force. Um, and it's at the same angle, d theta over 2. So we also get sine of d theta over 2. Now here's where we're going to use the fact that d theta is really small. right? We're considering an infinitesimal arc um, or, or um, element of rope. So um, we know that d theta is really small. We can write that it's much less than 1, which means that this term that we've got, sine of d theta over 2, is roughly equal to just the argument itself, d theta over 2, right? This is called the small angle approximation. Um, and so what we can do is use that in a, a force balance equation and say that r is therefore roughly equal to, um, <clears throat> so we're going to have t, uh, t d theta over 2 from this first term. Then from the second term, we're going to get another t d theta over 2, right, from this t here times this, this sine term. So we get 2 d theta over 2, which is just t d theta. And we're also going to get a, um, from the second term, we're going to get a half d t d theta. But then what we can do is say that, well, we've got two infinitesimal quantities multiplied together here, right, d t times d theta. And so we're going to basically just ignore that because it's much smaller than this first term, right? This is just kind of first order in infinitesimal quantities, whereas this one here is second order. Okay, so we can neglect that, and we've got r is roughly t times d theta. Okay, um, <clears throat> so that's simpler than we might have expected from this complicated looking force diagram. Uh, let's think about the forces in the, in the other direction, uh, which is the tangential direction, right? So resolving along this tangent line, um, so what forces do we have? Let's consider the forces acting like up and to the right. We have uh, t plus dt, but then the tangential component of that is going to be cos of d theta over 2, right? So let's think about this force here. We resolve it along this dashed line, and we get a, a cos d theta over 2. 
What about the forces um, that are acting uh, in the opposite direction tangentially? Um, well, we have a uh, t, t cos d theta over 2, all right? Um, but we also have a friction, f, right? So t cos d theta over 2 um, plus f, all right? So there we go. And then we can again use our small angle approximation. Um, so we can say that cos of d theta over 2 is roughly 1, right? Okay, if we were to do a slightly better approximation, we would say it's 1 minus um, d theta over 2 all squared divided by 2. If we wanted to go like one order higher in the approximation of the cos, but for now, um, I mean, because it's an infinitesimal quantity, it's good enough just to say it's roughly 1. Um, and so, what we get is that t plus dt is roughly equal to t plus um, f, right? Which very nicely gives us f is roughly dt, okay? So, we've got two independent equations from considering our force balance on this element of rope. Um, now remember that the problem is we want to know how much force we have to apply. What's this force P that we have to pull on the rope with in order to cause it to slip, right? And if we think about the smallest possible value of P that will cause slippage, that is when the rope is on the point of what we call limiting equilibrium. Okay, uh, so it's kind of about to slip, which means the friction is as big as it can possibly be. It can't get any bigger. Um, <clears throat> and in that case, that's why we can use this, this coefficient of friction, right? Because if it's about to slip, we can say that the frictional force F is mu times the normal reaction force. This is the definition of the coefficient of friction. Okay, and so if we take this, F is mu R, and use the two equations we've got so far. So this one up here, one, and this one here, two, right? We know that F is dt, okay? So we can write that as dt is equal to mu, and we also know that R from equation one is t d theta, so we get dt is mu t d theta, okay? So now what we have is actually a differential equation which we can just solve, right? And <clears throat> fortunately it is a differential equation where we can separate the variables. And so I'm going to write this as dt over t, just put all the t's on the same side, um, is equal to uh, mu uh, d theta, okay, just divided by t. And then we can integrate both sides like this. Okay, I can put this integral sign between the mu and the d theta uh, because mu is just a constant. And let's think about the limits of integration. Well, when theta is zero, right, when theta is zero, we're basically at the far left point of the of the rope, right? At the point where it's just started to be wrapped around the cylinder. At that point, we know we're applying a force of P0, so the tension just has to, has to balance that force P0. So when theta is zero, uh, the tension has to just be P0, okay? Similarly, when you remember that it's wrapped around n times, so the total angle that it's wrapped around by is going to be just 2 pi times n, right? Because one rotation is 2 pi radians. Um, <clears throat> and then on the opposite end of the rope, we're pulling with a force of p, remember? And so that's going to be our upper limit for this um, integral on the left, all right? And so <clears throat> what do we get when we do this? Well, integrate 1 over t, you get log uh, of t, right? Natural log of t. Um, and so the left hand side will be log of p minus log of p zero, which we can use <coughs> the laws of logs to simplify um, to natural log of p over p zero, right? And this integral on the right is very easy. Um, it's just theta, right? If you integrate d theta, it's just theta. And so um, this just becomes two pi n mu. Okay. Uh, and Finally, we just rearrange this, um, exponentiate both sides, multiply out by p0, and we find that p has to be equal to p0 e to the 2 pi n mu. So there you go, that's the force that you would have to um, apply to the other end of this rope in order to get it to slip. Now, <clears throat> of course, it could stay in equilibrium if you applied a smaller force. Um, it just you'd have a you'd have a smaller friction. So this is the minimum force you need uh, in order to cause um, slippage. Okay. Now, 
I hope you found this interesting. Um, I think this is, this is quite a fun problem. I always like these problems where you have to kind of split things up into, into small elements um, like this. I am planning to uh, say more about this topic in the very near future, so I'm going to consider how we can apply this equation uh, to the problem of two masses um, hanging on either side of a, a pulley. I'm going to try to develop the model even further and um, include the mass um, and the, the weight of the string. Okay, so hope to see you again uh, soon to go over some more uh, interesting physics problems.